Good evening and welcome to Copperfield's Books virtual event with Chip Bell in conversation with Anthony Lee Head. My name is Jamie and I will be your moderator for the evening and I just have a couple quick things for you before we dive in. So a reminder to keep your eye on the chat box tonight. I'll be sharing the links to buy tonight's title, discount codes, upcoming events, you know, everything you'll need. And for any questions or comments for tonight's guest, go ahead and submit them under the Q&A icon, which is right at the bottom right of your screen. So now I'm thrilled to introduce tonight's authors. We don't have just one, but two tonight. Charles Chip Bell Jr. lives in the city of New Kensington, Pennsylvania, and is a practicing attorney who specializes in personal injury litigation. He is the author of currently 19 volumes in the Jake Sullivan series, and he is the co-author of a feature film script, Cuba Libre, a television and a television pilot script, A1A, that are both based upon the Jake Sullivan series. And in conversation with Chip tonight is Anthony Lee Head, the award-winning author of Driftwood, Stor Stories from the Margarita Road, which recently won another award. He has been a trial attorney, a college teacher, and a black belt martial arts instructor. Tony is also an ordained lay Buddhist with the San Francisco Zen Center and lives just north of the Golden Gate with his wife, Sherry, and seven rescue animals. So they are with us tonight to celebrate Chip's 19th book in the Jake Sullivan series, Why Don't We Get Drunk? We're so thrilled to have you both with us tonight. Why don't you go ahead and get us started, Tony? Thank you, Jamie, so much. And uh, thanks to everybody over at Copperfields who does such a great job for, for supporting um, authors and readers uh, in our community here in Northern California. So, Chip, I'm not going to waste a lot of time doing a bio of you. I'm going to jump in and uh, I'm going to start by saying when I first discovered your books and discovered you, there was a feeling that I had met a, a brother from another mother. So much, <laughs> so much of our lives paralleled growing up in the Midwest and being trial attorneys, same type of trial attorneys, plaintiffs uh, work for people that needed help and, uh, and then becoming authors. But um, I've got to ask you, how does, how does a guy born and raised in Pennsylvania lives the American dream, um, serves his country, and does his time in the army, comes back, uh, goes to law school. Um, you've been active in supporting uh, legal associations in your community. And then all of a sudden you fall off the edge and start writing <laughs> Jimmy Buffett inspired mysteries. Why don't, why don't we start with, with, uh, when that happened, when did you when did you create Jake Sullivan? Well, uh, I have to go back a little bit before that. I have a very good friend. His name's Mike Langer. And uh, he came to me one summer and said, hey, Jimmy Buffett's coming to town. You want to go to the concert? We go every year and, you know, we'd like you to come. And of course, at that point in time, as you said, I had been in the Army after graduate couple days I went in actually after graduating from college got married uh it had my first daughter and I just didn't really have a lot of time to pursue other interests specifically music except what I was primarily focused on which was Motown in those days that's what I sort of grew up with and uh so Mike said well you know you'd really like this and I said the guy has one song why would I like <laughs> and he so he he got me uh, songs you know by heart and I listened to it and by the time I got through a pirate looks at 40 I was hooked uh, and I sort of became immersed in this guy trying to find out you know how he came to be and the songs and everything else and then one day in 2010 I had been I had gone to concerts now I'm going to interrupt you for one second. Go ahead. Prior to that time, had you spent much time vacationing or visiting down in the Caribbean? No, no. We had gone, I think we had gone on one family cruise on, if you remember it, the Big Red Boat. Yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> to the Bahamas with the kids. Uh, I had gone to Florida on one spring break, and that was about it. 
But I will admit, when I was young, my favorite thing, as soon as I read Treasure Island, was pirates. I have always loved stories about pirates. So um, I, I decided that it was a rainy day in October of 2010. I just got done, <clears throat> pardon me, speaking with my youngest daughter, Jessica, and our song was Come Monday. And uh, I was just sitting there and I was a, I've always been a voracious reader. I read a lot of action adventure uh, series, Clive Kessler, uh, James Patterson, uh, Robert Ludlum, those types of things. And I was sitting there and I thought, you know what? I should write a book. So I did. And well, uh, go ahead. Yeah, and so again, this this connection between us, uh, my connection was one Chris with with the uh, with the uh, whole Parrothead experience. One Christmas, my wife gave me the a boxed set of Jimmy Buffett uh, songs, uh, boats, ballads, speeches. Um, bars. I can't bars, bars. Thank you. Yeah, the most important one, and I couldn't remember it. Thanks. <laughs> and. Um, you know, I, I said, this is nice, but I, I don't, same thing. I don't know this stuff. She said, well, you like his music. I said, I, I like that one song, you know, which, yeah. <laughs> which yeah. everybody, everybody liked Margaritaville. That was a great song. Right. So, um, you know, I spent a long winter driving back and forth to, to court and listening to, to this in the car. And the idea of escaping um, to a tropical paradise just you know, hooked me. I just grabbed the whole thing. Yep. And, uh, and I think that's happening. And, and I think it happens because you mentioned Treasure Island. Uh, let's talk for a moment about our, our common inspirations. There's a thing people now talk about genres of trop rock or trop lit. There has been a escape to the tropics and live in paradise theme in our culture since treasure island um absolutely, absolutely. Mark, mark twain and uh, and joseph conrad and uh, you know the classics then and up until uh, um tales of the south pacific by michener um you know jimmy wasn't the first to start that but he was sort of the first to plug it into our generation don't you think i think that and i think even in those genres there was some degree of seriousness that was more than what buffett pervade in what he did it was not only escapism it was a hell of a good time it's basically what he was saying it was fun and, uh, you know, if you spend a lot of time in the Pittsburgh area, and I know it gets cold in San Francisco, too. I was there once in the summer. It was like winter. <laughs> uh, but and you, you start to think about as you listen to his music, you're there. The palm trees, you can feel them swaying. You can hear the surf, you know, it, and he has an amazing capacity to do that, which I, I think that's why he's been so successful. Uh, but I just, I made the song up about, you know, I had gone, I'd been to Key West a couple times by then. I loved the town. I just loved Key West uh, back then. This was 25, 25 more years ago. And uh, I just thought that's where I'd make, I'd make the story happen there because I enjoyed it so much. And uh, as far as Jake Sullivan, Jake's the name of, was the name of my dog at the time. And uh, I liked how it went with Sullivan. That's well, how I got Jake Sullivan. I already told you about Mike Langer, my best friend. Well, that's where Mike Lang, the sidekick, came from. Well, so. you know, and I have to say, you know, the Jake Sullivan, who, for those of you who don't, aren't familiar with, with Chip's books, Jake Sullivan is the primary character through 19 books. And uh, he, um, he is born and raised in Pennsylvania, um, goes to law school, has a wife named Linda, has two lovely daughters named Jennifer and Jessica. Does any of that sound familiar to you at all, Chip? <laughs> well, yeah, I took a little bit from reality as I went along. <laughs> but the other thing I noticed that um, 
where's my list here? Um, bear with me. I made some notes. Okay. Now, and, and through 19 books, uh, Jake has adventures that take him to Miami, to Key West, to Cuba, to the Virgin Islands, to Jamaica, to Tampico, Mexico, to St. Bart's, to Martinique, and of course, to Western Pennsylvania. We can't leave that out. Um, right. My wife's from Western PA, so I'd be in trouble if I didn't give them a <laughs> shout out. Um, and the truth is, after I got the the bug of... Uh, of finding a tropical paradise, I, I've seen most of these pieces, places. Um, have you traveled? Have you seen these? Or is this armchair traveling? Or have you put your foot on some of these islands? I put, I put my foot on a lot of them, but I have not been to all of them that I write about. But I have been uh, to the Bahamas, the Leeward Islands, the US and British Virgins, Jamaica, Mexico, uh, both coasts. Um, I think that's probably about, I've not been to Cuba. I've not been to Martinique. Yeah. The Cuba is on my bucket list for sure. Me too. Yep. Me too. Um, but you know, so, and you know, that shows in your writing, in your books that, that you've seen the places that you write about and that you place Jake in. And um, I'm, I'm going to take a moment to read something you wrote. Um, and now this is from the last book. Um, the most recent book, not the last, the most recent okay. um, from uh, Why Don't We Get Drunk? Um, and, and this this is the acknowledgement in the forefront of the book, and it really touched me. It goes like this. Anyone who visits the Caribbean knows that it is a place where the cultures of the world have met, sometimes in war, sometimes in peace, sometimes coming for a better life, sometimes coming in chains. And those diverse cultures have given rise to legends and stories told by members of those cultures from one generation to another. These myths and legends give us present day writers material for the tales we tell. And I, for one, owe a debt of gratitude to them. I, I, I feel the same way. I, 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 one of my personal uh, bugaboos is that so many people look on the cultures of the Caribbean. They ignore it. They look on the Caribbean as a big Disneyland. They go, they visit, they jump in the water, they go home. Um, but there are fascinating um, peoples there. There are cultures, there are stories, there are, are different ways of life than our own that really can move us and teach us and uh, inspire us. And and I think that's the best thing that storytellers like Buffett can do is lead the rest of us to um, to examine those places on those terms, not just it's another great vacation, but this is some place we can learn from. And um, I take that away from your books, to be truthful. I, I see that in Jake's adventures. When he goes someplace, he's not passing through. He's part of what's happening. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I actually, each book that I do, <clears throat> I start out by researching legends, pirate stories, treasure stories, anything I can think of for the specific place I've decided I want to go to. And usually I find one and uh, it I then weave a story around it that brings it from sometimes as early as biblical times to the present day to get Jake involved in it. And practically every story I write is that way. I love history. Like you just said, the culture of these places is fascinating if you take the time to immerse yourself in it. The stories that people tell, given what they had gone through in their past, what their families had gone through, what they go through by way of nature alone, but they have suffered through at times. It amazes me how much joy there still is in the things they talk about and their culture and what they try and leave with other people. And I try and bring some of that into the books that I write. Well, you do. You do a good job. And it, it reminds me of something a friend down in Mexico once said to me, which is that uh, um, there's so much 
that you can't see if you are just sitting in the resort to lobby bar. You've got to get out there and you've got to meet the people. You have to walk the streets. Right. And uh, and if if as writers, as storytellers, we inspire people to do that, well, then we're doing our job right, I think. But but Great. now I'm going to get to the fact that every book you have, the, the latest being the 19th um, Why Don't We Get Drunk, is based on a Jimmy Buffett song. Now, um, I have a load of questions about that. Uh, I understand the inspiration. My first question is playing lawyer. Does did Jimmy say that was okay, or has have you never received a letter saying cease and desist? No, no. <laughs> Actually, uh, basically, it's just the title, and you can't copyright a title. Fair, mark, fair game. Um, I had sent his people a letter when I first started explaining this process. What happened after the first book? I decided I liked it so much I wanted to continue. I, so then I started thinking both financially and just structurally how I would do this. So I figured, well, my first book is a Jimmy Buffett song title. So if I use a Jimmy Buffett song title for all of them, That'll sort of make my series cohesive. And it's also a market, right? There Absolutely. Yeah. But you're and, right. It does tie them together. Right. And so I did. I wrote Margaritaville or whoever I wrote to back then explaining I was going to do this. And was there an issue? And I never got anything back. So lo and behold, after the first book comes out, uh, I was in Key West talking to someone I knew who actually worked for Buffett in Key West and uh, they introduced me to someone there who ran the store and they put my first book in the Margaritaville store in Key West. Well, there's a approval Monday, right there. Come Monday was there and they told, they were very honest with me. They said, look, people come in here want Jimmy Buffett's books, <laughs> you know, like the one on the <laughs> shelf behind you. They really don't care about anybody else. I said, I get it. I understand, but I just appreciate it, you know, and uh, it was there for a year like they promised me and then it was gone and that's okay but it was it got me started and it uh it was just a i mean i had a book in jimmy buffett's margaritaville key west you I think know? that's wonderful and, yeah. and and it points to the fact i mean you know we all adore the the buffett songs and books and storytelling and god bless jimmy but of course this is bigger than he is the 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 key to the dream of paradise of the dream of running away or owning a part of uh, a world that hasn't been taken over by civilization yet that that belongs to all of us um, right. and and the more we spread it the more the way i figure it is the more we spread that story the more chances maybe we'll protect some of those areas that still haven't been paved over yet that's that's, that's my right. dream at any rate that's right but uh, i mean as as terms of listing the books by the song titles i'm reminded of uh the great uh grand master of mystery writing uh, john d mcdonald i'm sure oh, you're I know. inspiration for anybody who puts pen yep. to paper in the last right. hundred years exactly. um um when he wrote the the legendary still in print travis mcgee novels and for anyone watching this if you haven't read John D. McDonald's Travis McGee novels. Skip my books. <laughs> skip, skip go mine. tonight and get John yeah. D. McDonald's book. That's right. Um, he decided he needed some sort of gimmick to tie his um, his series together, and he picked colors. Right. So every book in the series has has a different color in the title. Exactly. It's, it's, yeah, I think it's a it's a wonderful way to stick it in people's minds. Yeah, and. It is. And that's part of what we do. I mean, it you can write the greatest book in the world, but if people don't know what's out there, if people don't find it and and pick it up and read it, you haven't accomplished much. So independent writers, publishers um, like us, like you and me, and hundreds of thousands of other people now, we have to find ways of getting it in front of the reading public and saying, pay attention to this. Right. And uh, and hooking your your series to the Buffett mania, I think, is a brilliant way to do it. Frankly, Thank you. but um, 
but you're not limiting yourself to books anymore. God, you know, I, I feel like such a, <laughs> I feel like such an incredible slacker. You know, I'm happy I wrote a book. You've got 19 books. You write two books a year. I sit back and go, you know, how does he do that in practice law? You know, I'm retired <laughs> and I, I can't find the time to do that. But now you're writing trop rock songs with some great musicians and you're doing talk about that a little bit. How did how did you bust over it for again, for those who may not be familiar, there is a genre of music, um, a, a culture in 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 our country of people who love storytelling in musical form about the things that that we've been talking about, about escaping to paradise. And somewhere along the line, it got the name of Trop Rock, Tropical Rock. And well, you take it from there. You've gotten involved in that fairly well. Well, um, it was by accident, really. It was no, no great thought process of mine. But uh, I was at uh, Meeting of the Minds, the annual Jimmy Buffett Parahead Convention in Key West. Uh, I, I've been a vendor there for I don't know how many years, selling my books. And it let that, of course, is a big trop rock music festival. And I met a lot of people through that. Um, and what happened was I uh, found a magazine called Flockers Magazine that dealt with trop rock and things like that. And I thought it'd be a good place for me to advertise. So the, the lady that owns it and publishes is named Katie Waugh. She lives down in Mississippi. So I called her. I said, listen, I write these books and I explained it. And <laughs> what she said was, how in God's name haven't I heard of you before? <laughs> and I said, well, you heard of me now. So is it okay if I advertise? She goes, better than that. She goes, I'm making you flocker of the month. And I, I, <laughs> I want to make sure I heard her right because it could have been a bad thing. Yeah. As an and attorney, said, oh, you've been, you've been I said, called That's a good thing. Before. And she said, yes. So, okay. So we were okay. So. From that, I just became friends with her. Really, really, she's a great lady. I really became good friends with her. And I called her once and said, listen, I said, I think it would help my books and I would enjoy the hell out of it if Jake Sullivan series had a theme song. Now, when I grew up, I think we're the same age. Were you born in 50, like me? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, when you were a teenager, everybody wanted to be a guitar hero, right? Right. So, but I'm tone deaf. I can't carry a beat in a satchel. I mean, it's horrible. If I'm singing a song, the only request I get is to shut up. Okay. So, but I love music. I've always loved music. So I tell Katie, I, you know, so she says, well, there's two guys, one named Eric Stone, one named Donnie Brewer. Uh, both of them would probably be good. So first one I contacted was Eric Stone and we got together and he essentially, I gave him the title, he essentially wrote the song. That's the way he works. Uh, so that became Topical Crimes in Tropical Climes. And it did well. It went on the uh, Radio A1A has a Trop 40 countdown and it went to number one and it was, it was, it was really good. And I like the song. A lot of people seem to. Well, then I became close with Donnie Brewer Eric Babin uh, on Radio Trop Rock and saw them at a couple of events and got to talking with Donnie and we decided to do one, which I had a little bit more input on, although, believe me, it was his finished product that, you know, sealed the deal, not mine. But I gave him some ideas and thought we worked it out. And anyway, so he put it on his Blues Lagoon album, which went crazy. That album did so well. And the song on it was uh, Trouble in Paradise, The Ballad of Jake Sullivan. So there, then now I have two songs about the series. And um, are you working on another? Well, yeah. Not, I, back in Pittsburgh, there was a guy who lived in town named John McDonald. He had a group called John McDonald and the Mango Men. And he believes, and I think the way he's told me it is probably true, he coined the term Trop Rock because he was doing it back in Pittsburgh way back when uh, that he moved to Florida. I lost track of. Well, as the usual things that happen in Key West happen, I met him on a bar stool in Sloppy Joe's. <laughs> I'm sorry, Captain Tony's saloon, the old Sloppy Joe's, but Captain Tony's. 
and we got to talking and we kept up a correspondence and then he uh decided that you know he would do a couple songs related to my works and he did one on the book that we're talking about now there's a there's a sorceress a myth about a sorceress in that book called la Dables, the devil woman mm -hmm. so he wrote a song la Dables, pertaining to that and now he's writing one for the one i'm working on now volcano about montserrat so uh that's how it happened and i got involved with all these uh trop rock uh how should I put it? They're, they're mostly charitable events, but there are all these events that happen, yeah. like meeting at the, um, on the bay and you know things like that, and which I try and donate to and help out with. And so I've gotten to know the people involved in the genre more, and I just love it. I mean, who ever thought I'd be involved in music with my lack of anything, <laughs> anything having to do with musical skill? But I, it's, it's this whole thing. I tell this to people all the time that I talk to, and it's the absolute truth. This is not work at all. It is totally fun. Uh, I love writing the books. I have fun with the people I meet. I've met people such as yourself, other people I never would have met in my lifetime that, that are just great. It's given me a whole new perspective on things. And, uh, you know, well, that, I mean, you know, hell, I have a song and a beer named after my product. <laughs> what could be better, right? <laughs> well, you know, that goes to that goes to part of the trial of of what we face as as, as uh, independent writers, and you know it in twenty years ago, uh, this would have been impossible. If if you wanted to put music out into the world, you had to get discovered by somebody and go to a big recording yep. agency. If you wanted your book to be read. You had to find an agent and you had to pray that someone publishing company would would pick you up and, and maybe put you on a shelf someplace. Technology has has opened up the world for more and more people to to send their voice out there for others to appreciate. The and price. so that's that's true for people like you and I who write and and now can put our own books out there and and ask the public to judge them uh, on their on their own value rather than on uh, through some agency somewhere but that's happened with music now too i mean the, the the number of people i listen to are no longer just people that get the approval of a of a big corporation to put it on the radio it's amazing the individual storytellers and that's what musicians are good musicians sure. to me are storytellers sure um who who have latched onto this theme that that we so love which is finding paradise out there someplace the, the tropical right. world and so it's i'm amazed that there isn't more a uh, cross pollination between trop lit and trop rock but i salute you for for actually stepping in getting that going and now we've got now we've got trop booze with your beer company going. So <laughs> you're you're an inspiration to all of us, you know. <laughs> so when let me ask you this: when you write, um, do you have a? I mean, you write an amazing two books a year. I mean, that's stunning to me. But do you set a writing schedule? Do you write when you feel like it? What's your what's what's your approach? I usually start. Uh after the Super Bowl. And I put a book together in February, March, and April. Usually I have it out by mid-April or sometime in early May. This one's going to be out in a couple of weeks. I'm finishing it up now. Volcano, number 20. Uh, I don't have a schedule at all. Um, I do it when I want to. I usually have uh, at least one day in the weekend that I can devote to it if I want to every weekend. So I do that. Um, and I actually don't write, I dictate. I'm impressed. That That's amazing. Well, I mean, I start out in the legal practice that way, you know, and it just, for me, it, it's, it, it's, I'm telling a story, it's easier for me to do it orally. I don't know whether that's, be, you know, from trial work with a jury or anything else, but to me, I can get, it's funny, I can, when I say some, some guy's a bad guy and I'm talking as the bad guy's talking, 
my secretary always laughs at me because she says, are you the good guy or the bad guy on this particular tape? And I said, well, you'll know once you listen to it, right? She goes, oh, I'll know. Yeah, that's for sure. I'll know. Because <laughs> I get in character. I mean, you know, but it it makes it flow better, be more realistic to me in the book when it's done that way. For me, not everybody, but for me. Does that cause you more work editing? I mean, when you when you read through the draft, are you finding yourself um, saying, oh, OK, I because I know that's when I dictate. I get a flow of language going that doesn't always in a written transcript work well for the written page. Right. And she, as I dictate sections, uh, she likes me to keep my dictation to an hour or less. It's easier for her to do it that way. So she'll do one. I'll be dictating another one. She'll be typing the one I get it back. And then we just go back and forth. Yeah. I edit on paper. Yeah, so do I. Absolutely. And and I'll, I'll I'll try to edit as I write. Yeah. But it doesn't always um it doesn't always work. Sometimes I just have to sit right. down with a red pencil and the paper and the and the words on the paper in front of me and look at it. But um um in my second so, book I start like usually in August because I want it done before Meeting of the Minds starts at the end of October so I can take the new book with me. And, and that raises the issue of how as, a, as an independent published publisher, writer, you promote your book. It's, it's difficult for us to get people to accept our books. You know, we, I have found that independent bookstores, God bless them, like, like Copperfields, who is, who is uh, sponsoring this, uh, this conversation tonight, um, are willing to take a chance on us and, and put our books on their shelves. But um, as one agent, when I first started writing Driftwood, I, I had two interesting experiences. I, I took it to an agent who said, well, you know, this is kind of like this stories, kind of stories that would appeal to Jimmy Buffett fans. And how many of them could there be? Uh, you, you have no <laughs> idea, but, but, but uh, <laughs> this young yeah. lady in New York just didn't get it. Um, and then um, another agent explained to me pretty clearly, said, you know, there's, there's so many, there's only so much shelf space across the country in bookstores. And if a bookstore has to choose between your book, which nobody's ever heard of you, and Stephen King's latest volume, th there's no choice. And I get that. That makes sense. Right. Right. But but there are independent bookstores out there, as I say, like Copperfields or uh, uh, Suzanne Orchard's uh, little bookstore in Key West, uh, Key West Island Books, or some right. others that that are willing to take a risk on unknown authors like us and help us um, get our works out there. And of course, there's the internet, there's social media, um, but it can be a struggle, can it? Yeah, it is. Uh, you know. I tell people um, that, you know, it, it, some days sales are up, some days they're down. I'm certainly not James Patterson, nor do I feel that I ever will be. But the thing it is, uh, anything I derive from it monetarily is a bonus. This isn't my life's work. Uh, this is enjoyment. I'm getting paid to have a really good time. And hopefully, so, hopefully I'm giving some other people a really good time, at least for a brief period of time when they read the book. I mean, I don't take uh, reviews that tell me I should go away and never write again, or that think this is the greatest book since the Bible. Uh, you know, I don't take either of those very much to heart. I, I am happy that there are people who like my books, who buy my books, uh, do I wish there were more? Sure. Uh, I, I would love. The one thing I want to do that I haven't done yet, I need to get that movie made. But boy, that's <laughs> tough. That is really tough. That's a different, uh, that's a different step. Oh, jeez. Yeah. But anyway, uh, but I, like I said, to me, I do this because I enjoy it, not because it's work, not because I have to feed my family. So and that does. I realize that puts me in a different atmosphere than some other people who really are depending on being a writer who makes money to, you know, have his life 
taken care of through that process. But I'm just lucky I don't have to do that. So I don't worry about it. Well, I, I'm not sure. And I agree with you 100%. Right? And I'm not sure that for those who decide they're going to make a good living writing, I'm not sure that's in their that's in their control. Sure, there are the the Stephen Kings and the James Pattersons, and good for them. But I remember reading an interview with uh, Ken Kesey. Um, I I hope to God young people still read Ken Kesey. But but uh, back in the '60s, he, he was a much much uh, sought after author. And I read an uh, uh, an interview where he said, "If you're writing to make money, you've chosen the wrong profession. You should write because you want to write." And that really struck me. Now, I I didn't start writing until I was seventy years old. I always wanted to write. There was always going to be that book in the future. Um, but when I sat down and and wrote Driftwood the first time. Um, uh, again, when I walked it around to some agents and some publishing houses, the response was, you're too old. Not that the book was aimed at old people, but they frankly, their position was, you don't have that much time to, to write future books that we should invest in you. I, I, was, <laughs> I was stunned with that, but, I, but one begins to see the business financial aspect of publishing that has nothing to do with whether storytelling is valuable or not. Um, and so that's when I discovered you could publish your own books and you could offer them to the public and, uh, and still get some rewards from that. I had a, I had an agent when I first started out. Um, I can't remember how I got her, but I did. And uh, you know, there were a lot of promises and terms like random house and, you know, things <laughs> like that. And, even I was somewhat amazed that somehow this little book would get into Random House, but you know. And we parted ways after a while, and then uh, I finally realized that my daughter had the technical skills because she's very, very good with computers to do the whole thing with Amazon. And so she and I do it, and that that's also made it you know worthwhile. I get to work with my own kid doing this stuff and uh like i said whatever happens happens i'm happy do you do you use an outside editor at all no that's something that i rely on quite a bit i i uh i was lucky to to uh meet an amazing um private editor who herself had been uh a wonderful best-selling author some years back and um i, I have to say her it's tough to have someone edit your book um, to have someone say, Oh, you could have said that better. Really? <laughs> you know, but, but once you get past that point, I've discovered that that works well for me, but it, it does take more time and it does cost some money to do that. But uh, I would recommend that for any young author coming up to, to have an outside voice, take a look at it. That's probably um, true. Yeah. Well, I mean, as I, you, uh, go ahead. I am. Um... I guess I've always had the perspective that when my book is in someone's hand and they're reading it, for better or worse, it's from me. No one else, it's from me. And that's just the way I've looked at it. I understand that 100%. And, and I can be very possessive about what I put on paper. But I also look at it as as a skill, not unlike being a trial lawyer. I, and as you, you know, I walked into the courtroom with a stack full of files from the San Francisco district attorney's office that had placed in my arms um, at the age of 27 and uh, started trying my first case. And I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And I really, you know, it, it was a skill that I developed over the next 40 years. And I've, I'm, I'm sort of taking that attitude about writing. Uh, storytelling is a skill. There's absolutely talent involved, 
but uh, I always like to push the edge a little bit and see if I can do a little bit more. And hearing that outside voice in my ear sometimes helps me with that. Sure yeah. Sure yeah. Um, there was another question I had for you, and uh, it just just popped out of my head. Give me a moment here. Um, <laughs> oh, I was going to ask you about uh, about Mike Lang. Um, so tell me about the, and now for, again, for those who are not, um, don't know the books yet, and I suggest you do, um, Mike is the sidekick. Every good mystery series has a, has a, a protagonist, the hero of the story, but he has a, a, um, a sidekick that, that has his back. And in the case of Jake Sullivan, it's Mike Lang. Tell us a little bit about Mike. Well, as I said, Mike Lang evolved from my best friend, whose name is Mike Langer. And the reason I chose to do it this way was I actually owe all of this to Mike Lang giving me a CD and pushing me to get into a car to go to a Jimmy Buffett concert, or none of this probably would have happened. So I owed him, number one. Number two... The dialogue that goes on between Mike and Jake is the way Mike and I talk to each other. We bust each other's chops all the time. Uh, Mike's only complaint about his role in the book is that he could be more funnier. <laughs> Which, if you knew, Mike really isn't true. But, I mean, you know, that's other than that, he seems to like his place in the sphere of things. And uh, I don't know, just a way of having him around. <laughs> that is the real is the real life mike an investigator no no he was uh he's been a businessman in various types of you know jobs uh but he's just he's a good guy well that's good wonderful guy. it's it's funny it reminds me of, um um craig johnson who writes the uh longmire book series wonderful yeah. mysteries yes um, they are yeah, yeah, just fantastic. And uh, I, I remember him saying um, the biggest lie in fiction is that little blurb in the front of every book that says nobody in this book is a real person. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Everybody absolutely in that book true. is a real person. Oh, yeah. yeah. And and so that's a nice way that, that you took care of Mike. Now, you gave Mike a whole book one time. I mean, I, did. Well, we, I thought that was complaining. interesting kept complaining uh, I, I, I have i was going to ask what the heck happened that jake suddenly is in a coma yeah. and mike takes over the book i said mike this one's yours <laughs> that's wonderful and of that's course if wonderful. you ask him which was the best book in the series guess which one he'll tell you well i gotta say it's a, <laughs> it's a good book it's one of my favorites um i love the cuba stuff but um that I just couldn't all of a sudden that came out is Mike going to take carry a book in the future or not or is that that's up in the air good what is Mike is is Mike Lang the character going to carry another book in the future or we'll just have to wait and see yeah he'll be around yeah I mean, <laughs> one I, form or another I, I I compare it to uh um Robert Cray's uh Elvis Cole series where uh, he started out with a sidekick, uh, Joe Pike. Great, great series. Just love him. But uh, then Joe became so popular uh, among the readers that he ended up having four or five of his own books where I he took over the that. book. People like Mike. People do like Mike. It's 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 worth considering. But I, but I just can't do it. I, his head would... I, I was about to say, you have to work uh, out a way that he doesn't... It would that. change the dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> Well, another thing, and, and looking at my notes, oh, uh, just general thoughts I gave myself. You know, you've picked the titles, and, and as you say, the title just gives you an inspiration that doesn't match the book perfectly. Um, but um, they're all great Buffett songs that people, you know, there's a saying, even there was a Buffett put out an album, a CD called Songs You Know By Heart. Now, and they were. They were songs everybody knows. You have a book called The Big Rig. 
nobody knows that Buffett song. <laughs> yeah, that was digging. You know, that uh, that struck me as that's that's stretching it a little. <laughs> well, I had to get in the deserts of Arizona, so may as well use a truck. Yeah. Uh, well, that... so I built a story around that. I mean, that and I promised the young lady who made me a charter member of the Quartzsite Yacht Club that I would write a book about it. So I did. There you go. Um, well, the, the songs are all all perfect. I, I, I like your, and I like all the islands. I love your ventures into Mexico. I, I may be, I'm one of those people who has actually spent some time in Tampico, Mexico. So Tampico, have you been there? I have not. I well, it, uh, it's it's an interesting place and and uh, the re for those watching the reason i'm referencing it there's a there's a great song by by mr buffett called tampico trauma uh, uh, about someone running into trouble down south of the border and uh, it's it's an interesting lovely spot on the gulf coast of mexico um and, and that rate running into trouble i i pulled a quote and let me find something so I can read it. There we go. Um, oh, this is from Tampico Trauma. This, this quote's from, from that book. The undercurrent of evil goes hand in hand with the beauty around it. And, and I think that's a theme. I don't know if you mean it to be, but it's a theme through your books where your characters find themselves find themselves in... Um, places of stunning physical beauty which is the caribbean or the tropics so it's called the tropics because that stretch or stretches around the world and um within the tropics there's that sort of strange paradox of oh my goodness this is the most beautiful vista i've ever seen but there's danger there's scorpions and snakes and there are bad people doing bad things uh, underneath the shadow of the palm trees down there. And I like that theme that, that it's not a playground. It's someplace that you have to be aware of the yin and yang of life. Did you consciously set out with that idea? I, I don't know if I consciously did, but I, Jake became a character to me who um, has a dark side. He, I mean, he was a, he's a lawyer, he knows about the law, but I find him and Mike both much more interested in justice than in legalities. That's why I didn't make him a courtroom lawyer. I wanted him to be out in, you know, adventures. I got him out of the courtroom as fast as I could and into former President Fletcher's outfit so he could go do these things. Uh, and I think that's true of anyone who qualifies perhaps as a, I don't know if hero is the right word, but uh, a protagonist uh, looks for things that don't necessarily jive with what we consider to be the proper and legal way to do things. But the results are often just, but they have a, that's a conflict inside him. That comes out at times and uh so that it's in him and it's in the situation they find themselves in and it's in the world they happen to be in at the time yeah i i reading the books the jake's jake reminds me more than anything of and now his name has popped out of my head tom clancy's character um that ryan Jack Ryan. He he's a Jack Ryan style of character. He works at the highest levels of government without being corrupted by it, uh, because he's a freelancer. Um, um, you know, and that's no small comparison. And I don't make it easily, but I, I think that's that's what it makes me think of when I read those books. Um, well, we're we're winding down here. Let me ask you this. Uh, Let's talk about future projects. Do you, so you, you've got something lined up for this fall. Right. Um, for Volcano is the name of it. Um, 
are you going to keep going? Is there an end in sight? Do you have a limit on how many how many books you're going to put out? I um, have the basic outline through book number 25. Okay, and where this coming one will be 20. Right. So that I'll hit 25 when I hit 75. So then I'll take a look around and see perhaps. Well, I'll tell you, I have a good friend out here in California, a, a, a great classic writer. Um, Herbert Gold is his name. And, and uh, Herb has been writing for decades and uh, he's... I, more his he's had more best-selling books than either one of us could ever dream of writing uh the new york times once said he was the writer he was the writer that other writers should read which is pretty good that's pretty good yeah good compliment but he he turned 98 this year and he's still writing so that gives me hope you yeah, know me too. there's, me there's too. no if you have a story to tell there's no no reason to uh stop um, do you? The day I sit down, I'm sorry. The day I sit down and I look at it and it looks like work, I'm done. And hopefully that won't come. <laughs> hopefully that won't. Any any non Jake books? Any standalone books? Now I have always uh, I've had oh god a manuscript I've written long ago in my desk forever about a a, a marshal out in the mining towns of Arizona at the turn of the century, dealing with a serial killer. And I hope to get to that one. But. I've, I've, I've got, uh, I, I'm finishing up a memoir that should be out this fall of, of the time my, uh, focusing on the time my wife and I spent running our small hotel in Mexico. And I hope it'll be fun and, and interesting. And again, storytelling that inspires people to look beyond their own borders and lives. And that's going to be called uh, uh, Mexico without reservations. And then I've got a mystery that I've been pounding out for the past year that I think probably will come to completion after the first of the year uh, set in um, San Francisco in 1967 during the summer of love. And that's called uh, uh a summer of madness it's the taken from a quote by hunter thompson a great gonzo <laughs> journalist yes. who said that in 19 <laughs> in, in 1967 the summer of 1967 in san francisco um you could find madness in any direction at any hour so uh that's that's the uh that's the thought there and i will say i have a i have a short story coming out um um josh packner who does edits and writes incredible stuff mysteries has a mystery anthology coming out in the fall called paranoid blues or paranoia blues uh stories inspired by by songs from um paul simon he did one from on buffett uh, songs inspired by buffett and uh, i have a piece in there and of course, it's set in the Caribbean. I couldn't resist. Sure. <laughs> so, um, and hold on one second. Um, well, I was just looking at a question that popped up, and uh, they were specifically asking, what about book 20? So book 20 should be out by September? No, book 20 will be out in May. In May. Later this month. Later wow, this month. okay. Now, you do one in the spring and one in the fall, right? Right, correct. So book 20 will be out in, in this month. Right. A couple and, of weeks. And then um, 21, we should look for October, maybe? Yeah. Late October, early November, somewhere in there. All right. Get to work. Well, I, I, have, <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, this has been a pure pleasure for me. I enjoy, the, I enjoy very much your work. Um, it is just... Uh, they are just fun reads and I enjoy the characters and uh, I enjoy visiting the places you take your readers to. So thank you very much for that. And, um, and um, I'm going to say before, before Jamie jumps back in, thank you to Copperfields. Um, they are one of those independent bookstores that, that Chip and I have been talking about that support writers like us. And we are very grateful. 
And I happen to know you can find uh, uh, Chip's books and my book um, on their website for on sale, in fact, for a good discount. So um, please take a look around there. And Jamie, now back to you. That was such a great conversation. Thank you both so much for being here. It has been just such a treat for, for everyone, I'm sure. Thank you for having us. Of course. And you have so much work coming up that we can hopefully plan for something in the future. Maybe even, well, in person might be hard with you in Pennsylvania, but we'll figure something out. Hopefully. We might tempt him out here to the West Coast. Yeah. I'll, I'll bring someone else's music and my beer. <laughs> there you go. That's a perfect match. Well, a few of you asked, yes, this is being recorded and everyone will receive an email tomorrow. It'll have a link to the recording, the discount code, both titles, links to um, where you can find more information about both authors and just everything you need. So if you just watched tonight, we've got you covered. And on that note, I really want to thank you both again and look forward to seeing you in person real soon. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Jamie. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.